Hi there, my name is Sarah. I am a senior scientist at the BC Center for Disease Control and I've really designed this presentation to be kind of self-explanatory in case I faint. Um, so let's see how it works. Uh, epidemiologist is really somebody who's looking at studying the distribution and patterns of disease within a population. Environmental epidemiologist, uh, a little bit more interested in the distribution of exposures within a population and how they affect disease. It's not really as sexy as our infectious disease counterparts. This shows up in things like video games and Hollywood movies and research funding. Uh, but we actually think that it's really important because the whole population is exposed to the environment and that makes an important risk factor. In 2009 in, in Vancouver we had a heat wave that killed 120 people. I like to compare that to H1N1 a few months later that killed about 60 people across all of British Columbia. The environment is important. Uh, the environment is also important in things like vector-borne diseases where <coughs> Uh, it can dictate uh, what, what lives where. And I was really surprised to find out that, that uh, Lyme, the surveillance for Lyme disease in Canada is done by going out and picking ticks off of mice that they catch. And my first thought was, well, if I had a, one of my three dogs came in with a tick, the first thing I would do is Google tick removal. And couldn't we use that kind of information to supplement what they're doing out in the field? And wouldn't that be valuable? And that was kind of my like, aha moment, which you probably all had about 10 years ago. <laughs> I'm, I'm behind on this slide. Um, what's important here is that diseases that are caused by the environment can be controlled by controlling the environment. So for things like heat-related morbidity and mortality, air conditioning is by far the most protective thing that we can do. Uh, this is really great from a personal health protection perspective because people can be aware of their exposures and can work to control their exposures. It's really kind of shitty from a population health protection perspective because it's really hard to understand exposure at the population level. Uh, there's a lot of these sort of heat island maps that are being developed for cities all over the world. They don't do a great job of predicting where people are actually going to die, um, which is problematic, but it made me start wondering, can't we use people's personal experiences of the environment and try to combine it with those sorts of methods to come up with better tools? And, you know, in a quick look through Twitter, it seems like you can find hashtags that are pretty specific to this. And then, then I saw this, this map of languages across London, and I got super excited because, my god, look at that spatial resolution. It's down to the street level. You could probably get it down to the building level. And this is before Caitlin's talk yesterday, and I realized that might be unethical. And then I saw this, and I thought, oh my god, we could do this in near real time. And if we can do it in real time or near real time, then we can do it to inform the way we react to these emergencies in near real time. And that would be really cool because right now one of the things we have at hand is mobile cooling centers and we can drive them around to places where we think it's going to be hot and where people are going to be suffering. What if we could drive them to places where we know people feel that they're hot and they are suffering? That would be a really big paradigm shift. Um, I, I'm not sure if this has been done already. This is an entirely new line of thinking to me. But I did do some searches, and I think these are pretty novel ideas. Um, well, probably not novel, but there, there's room here to grow. And, and they would be applicable in lots of other areas. You know, earlier this summer, Yosemite National Park said, hey, there's no smoke in the tourist areas. And then about four hours later, there was a ton of smoke in the tourist areas. So things like those really transient episodic exposures could benefit from this. Uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, where they had this huge haze event this summer, you know, they have maybe 10 air quality monitoring stations covering a population of 600 million people. We have about 60 covering a population of 4.5 million people in British Columbia. And then there's places in the world where there aren't air quality monitoring stations. And uh, this is Lambatar in Mongolia, which is one of the most polluted places in the world. Some of the early epidemiology out of this area was presented last month at the in International Society for Environmental Epidemiology. And as, as part of that presentation, what came out uh, from a guru in the field, who's Michael Jarrett, was that 
We, we have to go beyond single models now. We have to start blending exposure models and methods. And this is something that I would really like to try to do in Vancouver. My role, like so many others here, is uh, within an applied public health agency, and the research that we do really has the ability to be translated into policy almost immediately. Uh, the only thing is that I, I don't even know what an API is. So, you know, we, we need help. We have a really... We have a really strong technical team, we have a really quantitative team, we have no clue how to approach this problem, and that's really why I'm here, it's kind of like a scoping exercise. Thank you very much. Thank you.